in celebration of Serge's birthday, we're going to tell about his birth. If you haven't noticed already, we've been posting a lot of birth videos. You mean birthday? <laughs> Not birth videos. <laughs> we've been posting a lot of birth videos. <laughs> no, we've been posting some birthday videos. We had Audrey's first and then mine, and then uh, Serge's birthday was last week, and we're going to get that, that video up soon. This is our birthday season right now because we have three birthdays in January and two birthdays in February, both the beginning of February. So we're kind of busy with birthdays right now. Yeah. We thought that we ought to share the story of our baby boy, Serge. Uh, I was away at a dermatology conference. Audrey kept texting me while I was in lectures complaining that she's all nauseated and stuff and she just doesn't feel right. I texted her and said, I think you could be pregnant. And then a few hours later, she texted back and said, yes, I am. I mean, it was kind of expected, you know. Still, I had a little bit of wave of fear. This is our fourth child. I am very grateful to have our baby Serge, but hopefully he's our last. I would accept a fifth if, if we were called. <laughs> we're not planning on any more. We're not planning on any more, but if we were called upon to uh, have a fifth child, I would welcome that child. <laughs> Every child is a blessing from God. You know? So I got home, and then we had to deal with the pregnancy stuff, which Audrey loves so much. We actually technically decided not to find out the gender uh -huh. of this baby, but during the ultrasound, even though the tech didn't tell us that it was boy, Brian was like, oh, I totally saw. Yeah. And he was like, it's a boy. The technician totally got a shot of what they call the turtle sign. Turtle sign is, you know. Yeah, I think they can figure it out. All right. <laughs> and he, he got a good shot of it, and then he's like, oop. And he, he moved really quick. I was kind of like, dang it, I found out. But on the other hand, I was kind of relieved. I'm like, we get another boy. It's nice to have, you know, the two girls and then the two boys. Yeah, I think that it, that's a really good mix. So we had come up with a, a boy name and a girl name. Serge was Brian's grandpa's name. And then the girl name that we had was Nora, which was a family name back on my side. I think I came up with the idea is, okay, if it's a boy, I get to name him. And if it's a girl, you get to name her. I don't know how you feel about the name Serge. It's grown on me. I... She likes it now, but I, before I don't think she... I, I always I like the really name Serge. About it. I, don't I know. like names that are not too obscure, but they're not used a lot, you know? Well, nobody's... Hardly anybody knows the name Serge. No, what are you talking about? Sergio, you know? But Serge isn't Sergio. I know. Okay, so his name, we call him Sergio all the time, but his name is Serge. It's not S-U-R-G-E. It's S-E-R-G-E. I said, okay, we'll name him Serge. Uh, but instead of naming him completely after my grandfather, my grandfather was Serge David Clayton. We kept the middle initial the same and did Daniel after my dad. And I could see that you're a little reluctant. You're like, okay... And then she wanted to come up with Nora, which I, I guess I had to go along with, because I always think of a Nora as like an old woman. <laughs> Thankfully, we didn't have to name a child Nora. What? Sorry if there's any Nora fans out there, or any of you that are named Nora. No personal offense. So. I love the name. You know, I think our goal during this pregnancy was to get him to stay inside the womb for the entire term. All of our other kids were born early. And Greta had a few complications, not not too bad. Jade came out just fine. She went home the next day. Uh, and then Henry, he spent some time in the hospital. He spent eight days in the NICU. And that's another story. Maybe we'll go into that later, but he pretty much broke our, our bank. So yeah, They we were like a week and a half off on my due date, so I kept thinking I wasn't as far along as I really was. Uh -huh. Um, so it was kind of nice to find out it was actually further along than I thought. But we went to the hospital two different times, kind of false alarms. Before we actually had them? Yeah. So there's like three hospital visits. Yeah, three hospital visits. Yeah. All of our others were just kind of like, we wake up and we're like, you know what, let's just go to the hospital today. Let's just make it today. And we always go and they break our water and the, and the baby comes. This time around, we were just, 
I think the reason why we went was more so because when her water breaks, the baby comes within come quick. The baby comes within 20 minutes, you know, and I was always just worried, like, I don't want to have to deliver my own child. I really don't. If the, my water broke at home, we probably wouldn't make it to the hospital. Yeah. So it's more of a precaution, not so much like, oh, I just want this baby out of here. Because after Henry, I realized you got to keep the baby in there as long as possible. Because uh, otherwise they're going to have some breathing complications, which was Henry's problem. She saw the doctor earlier that day, stripped her membranes, and then... Uh, we went to the hospital like... I think we left at like 10, 15 at night, and then he was born at 11, 40, so just before midnight. So we weren't at the hospital very long. Yep. And the, do the doctor did the same thing, stripped the membranes, and he's like, oh, I might see you in about four hours or something, you know. Well, no, I always tell them. No, they don't like, believe you, though. He didn't believe you. Like, the nurse had to go run and get him, and he was just like, wow, that was pretty quick. You know, it was like within 10 minutes, he was already, like, crowning, you know. He was our biggest baby. He was eight pounds, one ounce. Oh yeah, he was big. And the first thing the doctor said once his head popped out, he's, the doctor was like, ooh, that's a nice round head. The strangest thing about the hospital we went to is like, once they all fixed them up, then they just left me and you alone in the room. When they did their initial exam, which I didn't really think much of, is, you know, they, they listened to his heart and they said, oh, he's got a heart murmur. And I'm thinking, Every baby's got a heart murmur when they come out, you know. The fetus has a hole in between the two chambers of the heart, uh, which closes once they're born within... Uh, what did they say, 24 hours? Or within 24 hours or something like that. You know, I'm not a neonatologist or whatever, but uh, I didn't think much of it. I'm like, every baby's got a heart murmur, whatever, you know. I remember he had the most pitiful cry. He was just like... <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at Audrey and I'm like, am I allowed to pick him up? They just like left us all alone with them. Like, okay, so I'm going to I'm gonna pick him up and I brought him over to Audrey. I just thought he was really, really cute. He, he kind of came out looking like Greta where he had a full head of hair. I brought the kids to visit and every time they evaluated him, they kept on saying, oh, he's got a heart murmur, he's got a heart murmur. And I kept on just kind of like, Whatever. It, it's not a big deal. Every every kid's going to have a little bit of a heart murmur. Uh, furthermore, me being, I'm a healthcare provider. Uh, I'm not a neonatologist, though. I'm not even a pediatrician. I've never really wanted to be. Um, but to me, he looked fine. He had good color. He's nice and pink. His O2 saturation was high, which is what it's supposed to be. And I really didn't think much of it at all. I was just so happy that he was breathing fine uh, because, you know, Henry's birth was a bit of a nightmare for me. The nurse practitioner there said, oh, let's just order an, an echocardiogram just to be safe. And I was thinking, uh, this is just what they do to kind of uh, cover themselves or what we call CYA. I'm just saying, you know, because I do it all the time. I see patients and there's certain things that I just do because I don't want to get in trouble. So I just order you know, the doctor came in the room afterwards, after they got it uh, analyzed, and he was like, well, we, we found a little bit of tetralogy of flow. When he said that, I was immediately in, uh, in denial, and, and I was also, I had a lot of fear. I could probably explain tetralogy of flow if I had a diagram up to show you. I had to study congenital heart defects in school, and you know, tetralogy flow to me was something that I never dealt with on a personal level because to me, tetralogy flow was just another test question that I had to pass in school. And of course, I had no clue what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, she didn't know what. You know, it, it, a really fascinating movie about tetralogy flow and the pioneering of the surgery, uh, the surgery to, to fix it is called. It's an HBO movie called. Um, uh, something the Lord made and it has most deaf in there the rapper Alan Rickman is in there he is? Wait, who's he playing? he's the he's the main doctor that that does this. that's Alan Rickman I was really shocked and uh, of course me being a healthcare provider the first thing that I did was I looked it up on the medical reference site that I use 
And the thing that was uh, really concerning to me is I felt that I knew that there's surgeries to fix it, um, but I was concerned about. Um, they mentioned that kids that have it have uh, learning disabilities. Not all, but most do. Sad to say, that was my main concern. You know, I don't think that I have the patience to deal with a child that has learning disabilities, and that's just that's my one of my own personal uh, um, flaws. But they told us he looks really good right now. It's only minor. He'll need surgery when he's six months old, but he can go home. So after we'd had him home for about a week, uh, my mom was here visiting with us, helping out with the baby. And I had fed him and gave him to my mom to hold. And then I could hear him start wailing. And I was like, what is going on? And my mom's holding him and he's screaming and arching his back and kind of freaking out. So I took him and his color was kind of blue. Um, and it's something they had warned us about in the hospital because um, babies with the heart condition, they have a, a tet spell. They call them tet spells. So basically he's not getting enough oxygen. So Brian was at the church building playing basketball. So I called him and told him what happened. And he was kind of, kind of brushed it off at first, but then he decided to come home, and before he got home, uh, Serge had another spell. So after Brian got home, we left my mom with the other kids, and we decided to take Serge into the ER to get him checked out. I brushed it off at first because, to me, that seemed normal. It, again, I, I hadn't dealt with this disease on a personal level. To me, tetralogy Fallot is a test question that I had to uh, pass, okay? She called and said, oh, he's turning blue a little bit, and I'm like, well... That's just a tet spell. Those are, those are. Uh, um, normal. They're. I was saying, oh, they're normal and they don't last forever. But then, you know, I, I kept on playing. I was like, you know what? I need to go home. I need to go home right now. And by the time I got there, he was in the middle of another episode where he's just kind of, just like flaccid and just kind of blue. And the issue is, is he he's able to breathe, but the way his heart is structured, the the blood is not going to the lungs and therefore the blood is not getting oxygenated. So the blood is still being pumped throughout the body but it's not oxygenated and there, therefore they turn blue or cyanotic. And he looked fine you know when we took him into the ER we had him in his car seat. I was worried that they were gonna turn us away or something. Turn us away or they're just gonna say oh just have a seat we'll you know and we'll sit there for four hours and I but they got us back right they, away. They did get us back right away. And yeah, Serge all hooked up. They, yeah, they got them all hooked up. And then he had another spell. And this one, this episode lasted about five minutes or so. I don't, they had me sitting on a like on the little hospital beds yeah. and had me hold him propped up. And he had a really, really bad spell. And I really thought um, that he was going to die because it, the spell was lasting so long and we were doing everything possible to, to snap him out of it. You know, we we're drawing his knees up to his shoulders. That's what you're supposed to do during a TET spell. Um, and his, his O2 saturation was down to like 26 or something. 26%, which I have never, ever seen it that low before. And he wouldn't snap out of it. I thought he was gonna die. I was just kind of, pacing back and forth because I was I was pretty much helpless. I was just sitting there with him in his arms and everyone around him is trying to snap him out of it. Even before he went to a spell, they did, they said, we got to transfer him to the, uh, the children's hospital. And they were going to set up for an ambulance to drive him, but after that, finally he snapped out of it, but after that uh, they said, no, he's got to go. He's got to go by helicopter. So they flew him in a helicopter down there. Audrey and I had to drive down there by ourselves. Um, Which is about an hour away. It's completely on the other side of the valley uh, here in the Phoenix area, which is a long drive. And when we get there, uh, they have him stabilized on morphine and a beta blocker called, I think it's, I think they had him on Esmolol, um, which I'm, I'm so grateful for these neonatologists um, these pediatric intensive care physicians and how smart they are um, 
in stabilizing, stabilizing our baby. They had him on a, a oxygen nasal cannula. He was that way for a week. They had a team of cardiologists and cardiothoracic surgeons. They, in that hospital, they review every case. They didn't, you know, typically they don't like to do a complete repair on these uh, tetralogy flow cases too early because the fear is, is that as the child grows, their, their heart's going to grow and it's going to grow out of the repair. So they were considering doing a minor procedure called a Blaylock shunt that they were considering doing that would really just buy him some time uh, and then they would have to go back and do the full repair later. But they determined that his condition wasn't as severe as most and so they felt confident that they could do the complete repair right now. And so they scheduled it for the next week. And um, this whole time we were, Brian took some time off of work. My mom decided to stay for an extra week to help out. Um, so we were kind of driving back and forth every day from our house in the West Valley all the way over to the East Valley. The East Valley. So we were going back and forth and it was, I don't know, exhausting. And I was pumping milk and it was just. I, I was pretty much emotional the the entire ordeal. Um, you get emotional talking about it. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Because <laughs> um, I thought he was going to die. Um, and I know I'm a healthcare provider and I've, I've helped out with surgeries before when I was a student. Um, I'd never done an open, uh, an open chest surgery before. And I knew that, you know, I, I was reading online, there's a lot of forums out there um, for people that were born with congenital heart defects. You know, some of these people are already into their 60s now. And you think the surgery back then was very primitive. You know, they, they were just figuring out how to operate on a heart um, back then. And now these people are living into their 60s. I, I thought, well, gee, we're in 2016, uh, the, surger the surgical procedures probably gotten much better. I don't usually, I know I'm a YouTuber, but I really don't like getting on social media. I get on Facebook sometimes, but I usually don't like to share a whole lot of personal information on, on Facebook. But I sent out a mass private message to all, uh, all of our close friends and family and just asking them to pray for Serge during his surgery. Um, one of my old classmates from uh, physician assistant school, she helped me out quite a bit, um, just sharing her story. And I was reading her blog about it because her son was also born with a congenital heart defect, which in my opinion, his, his defect was much, much more severe than Serge's. And her boy is, um, he's doing really great right now. And so she was able to comfort me a little bit and then the night before the, uh, the surgery, I took a video with my camera phone, and um, it's probably one of my, my most favorite videos of Surge at the time. <laughs> I'm sorry, you I get more emotional about things than she does. I have my moments, but yeah. We were feeding him a bottle or something like that, and he had his nasal cannula in, and he was kind of smiling a little bit, and so I wanted to get video of it, and um, I was kind of telling him, like, hey, why don't you smile for everybody? Because um, I was going to post the video on Facebook, and I was just telling him, all your fans are waiting for you to smile. And he gave, like, a half smile, and I said, that's kind of a smile. And then, then he gave a really big smile, and... All your supporters want to see you smile, bro. That was kind of a smile. There we go. I don't know, sometimes you think that these infants, they don't really understand what's going on, but at that moment, I knew that he knew exactly what was going on. And, uh...
surges have been very strong throughout this whole ordeal. And uh, I think that that was his way of telling us that I'm going to be okay. So we spent the night at the Ronald McDonald house, which thankful is just one night. With Henry, we had to spend a whole week there, and it just, it was terrible. Well, this Ronald McDonald house was better than the one in Oklahoma. It was. And I, the Ronald McDonald house, I'm very grateful for, even the time that Henry was dealing with his medical thing. Um, but it's just really difficult when you have kids. Anyway, so we spent the night there, got up the next morning for his surgery, which was scheduled for first thing in the morning. So we got to see him off and... That was a, that was another really hard moment because before surgery um, he couldn't have any food and so the whole time before surgery he's just so they're giving him a little sugar water yeah they they basically dip his binky in sugar water and put in his mouth to try to calm him down which doesn't last and your baby's just screaming wanting to be fed wanting to be held because you know, they're and then you walk down the hall with them before it goes into the the uh, the doors into the OR and um, and then we just had to sit and wait for hours. How long was the surgery like? Four or five hours or something. Four or five hours, something like that. And the nurse, the nurse kept on. There's a nurse that's like a liaison between the operating team and the parents, and um, she kept on coming in and give us updates and saying that he's doing really well. I think the thing that. I mean, that whole day, I pretty much, I, I think I cried pretty much that entire, like, anytime anybody, like, talked or did anything, I was just, like, a basket case, but I remember her coming in one time and saying, or we asked, like, how long the surgery would take, and she said, well, you know, four or five hours, it depends, but, you know, when you're operating on, on something that's the size of a walnut, you know, it, you gotta be extra careful, and that, that was the first time it, like, hit me, like, holy crap, like, his heart is literally, you know, like, this big you know because you think about your heart's the size of your fist and the size of a baby fist is teeny tiny we had a very good surgeon he's lds just like we are and before he took us into surgery he gave us a hug and he said um he offered to give the baby a blessing a priesthood blessing and i said no that's okay we've already had our bishop come over and, and help me give him a blessing but just the uh the thought of him offering to do that before he took him into surgery I'm just so thankful for how advanced we've become in medicine. And I know that these these surgeons that have trained, that have put in so many years into doing this, I'm a healthcare provider myself. I've only, I only put two years into medical training and now I'm practicing, you know. Uh, I even do surgery at my job right now. I perform surgery all the time. But these doctors, they spend almost a decade uh, learning how to do surgery, I know that God has given them the gift of, of uh, surgical skill, and uh, I'm so grateful for that. So when Serge finally came out of surgery, he just had tubes and wires he was all in, over. He was intubated, so he had a breathing tube through his mouth. He had a feeding tube through his nose. Of course, he had the, the huge incision midline chest that was covered by gauze. He's got two drainage tubes that are like right up in the epigastric region right here. Still got some, his scars, are, those scars are actually more pronounced than yeah. his chest scar you, If you try to look at his chest, the scars almost disappeared. They were telling us that he was going to take about two weeks. They said one week minimum, probably yeah. two weeks recovery time. In the hospital. So we had planned on, my mom had to go home, my sister was going to come and, and help for another week because Brian had to go back to work. Realize at this time, I I switched to a brand new job when Audrey was still pregnant. So he only been in his job for a couple months and, when all this happened. And I'm still I'm still at my job trying to prove myself. You know, my employer couldn't have been more generous. He just said take as much time as you need off. I still got paid. It was such a blessing to get that job when I did because. Um, I think the Lord knew that we we're gonna have some some issues with surge as well, and uh, I was able to take off all the time I needed. But every day we visited surge, they kept on telling us that he's surpassing their expectations. Like he's hitting all the milestones of recovery that he's supposed to. 
I think on the second day they finally pulled the breathing tube and he just continued to get better and better and slowly the wires started coming off. He came home only after four days uh, post-op. Which for that it sounded like some kind of record or yeah, something. Yeah, they were like, we've never discharged anybody this early. They couldn't believe how well he was doing. He's just such a strong kid. He's our, by far he's been our biggest kid and he's He's been our most active. most active baby. He was able to hold his head up at a very young age. He hit all of his milestones, like crawling and sitting up all early. He started walking at like 10 months, didn't he? 10 and a half, yeah. You know, he just barely turned one, and he's trying to climb stuff all over. We had to put a gate up. We've never had to do that before. If it could have happened to any of our babies, I'm glad that it happened to him, because he's been by far the most strong uh, physically to handle it. So we're really grateful to have Serge with us. We don't really talk about his heart stuff all the time. Like this is probably the, f well I made a video of, of Serge's heart, uh, heart surgery like, that was one of our very very first videos that we ever did, which no one ever really even noticed. It was more of a slideshow than anything. So I felt like we needed to sit down and have a better s storytelling of it. So. That's kind of the, the struggle that we've, we've gone through. Um, we're very grateful uh, to God for every child that we've been blessed with. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you later. Subscribe!